Right, let's get into the Word of God. We've got a, a little while. We'll condense some of these things down, but God can speak through his word, which is fantastic. If you'd like to turn to page 976, if you have one of the church Bibles, um, if you don't have one of those, turn to Matthew chapter 15, verse 29. And uh, we're going to be going all the way through to 16, verse 12 today. We have got three kind of separate narratives in this part here, three parts of this, this account that Matthew takes us through, um, and we'll look at each of them. The first two, we won't spend too long on them, because actually what you'll notice, these are things that we've already heard. It's the nice thing about going through a gospel account step by step is that we start to see where Matthew has shown us something before, but also then showing us something again. Don't switch off just because we've already heard these things. Context is very, very important. In the same way that some of you, if you enjoy your sport, will watch season after season. Actually, it's the same, isn't it? But the context is different. The, the World Cup this year is going to be in the winter. It's in Dubai. And there's the context of that is hugely different to other World Cups. Those of you that enjoy music, there are people that tour around. They do the same set every night, don't they? But actually, to the people that turn up to that particular gig, it's the greatest thing ever. Just because it's the same thing that has happened before doesn't mean it's not important. So we're going to look at those two things and then particularly focus uh, on this bit, uh, chapter 16, verse 5 to 12, which gives us, in some ways, Jesus bringing into context what he's done over the last we'll say weeks because that's what we've been studying, but obviously it's a slightly longer period of time in this uh, biblical narrative. Let's read it through um, and then we'll see what God wants to say to us. So uh, verse 29 of chapter 15. Remember, we've just come from Jesus um, dealing with the Canaanite woman, as Simon was showing to us last week. Uh, he's been in the district of uh, Tyre and Sidon. Um, and then it says, Jesus went from there and walked beside the Sea of Galilee. And he went up on a mountain and sat down there. And a great crowd came to him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put them at his feet and he healed them. I think we may have heard this before, so that the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, the lame walking, the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. Then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and had nothing to eat. And I'm unwilling to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. And the disciples said to him, where are we to get, such, get enough bread in such a desolate place to feed so great a crowd? Again, I think we've been here before. And Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? They said, seven and a few fish. And directing the crowd to sit down on the ground, he took the seven loaves and the fish. And having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up seven baskets full of broken pieces left over. Those who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children. And after sending them away, to, sending away the crowds, he got into the boat and went to the region of Magadan. And the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and to test him, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. Again, we've been here before, just a few chapters ago. He answered them, when it is evening, you say it is fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. But no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. When the disciples reached the other side, they had forgotten to bring any bread. Jesus said to them, watch and be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they began discussing it among themselves, saying, we brought no bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, oh, you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive? Do you not yet? Do you not remember the five loaves for the for the five thousand and how many baskets you gathered, or the seven loaves for the four thousand and how many baskets you gathered? 
How is it that you failed to understand that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to be aware of the leaven of the bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Father, we ask that in this time that we've got together now, you would speak to us. We thank you for your word. Lord, would you root it deep in our hearts? We thank you. You have given your spirit to us that brings it alive, that reminds us of the things that Jesus has said and also helps us to go in power to apply these things. So speak to us now, we pray. Amen. Amen. So as I said, there's two accounts here of things that we have kind of seen before. So the first one that we have is Jesus feeding a lot of people. This time we've got it recorded as being 4,000. Uh, the previous time it was 5,000. Remember, we were talking about that just being the number of men. Therefore, the size of the crowd is likely to be a lot bigger. Some say up to 20,000 or so. We, we don't know, but it was a large, large crowd. Now, the important thing here, actually, is Jesus is in a different setting. Now, the time when he fed the 5,000s a couple of chapters ago uh, that we looked at a few weeks ago, that was in a mainly Jewish part of town. It was likely that these were the Jews coming to listen to him. We now have him moving into more of a Gentile region. So we have Jesus providing for the Jewish nation with the bread that they needed in a reference to the manna that was given to them in the wilderness. And we also now have Jesus healing the cripples, making the mute to speak, the deaf to hear, and providing for a mainly Gentile crowd as well. We can see that just by in verse 31, where it says, and they glorified the God of Israel. So Matthew making the point that these are people that are looking in, they're praising the God of Israel. They see, they're saying, this is who your God is. We're going to praise him because of what he has done. So Jesus wonderfully provides and satisfies. Now, I'm not going to go over all the points that I made last time. If you need to hear that back, it's on our YouTube channel, Feeding of the 5,000, to learn about what it means for Jesus to provide and satisfy. But it's enough for us to see here that he does it again. Wonderfully, though, as we'll come to at the end, this isn't the main point that he's making. This is about, yes, his ability to provide for us, provide for the people of Israel, provide for the Gentile nations as well. But there's something more that Jesus wants us to learn from this. We then have this part at the start of chapter 16 where we have, once again, Pharisees and Sadducees coming to test Jesus. Now, you may remember we've looked at this previously as well before. They've done this back in chapter 12. They came demanding a sign, and Jesus once again said the same thing. No, no sign will be given apart from the sign of Jonah. Again, if you want more details on that, you can look back at that talk. But he's saying it's about Jesus dying and coming back to life. That's the sign that will be given. Nothing else more is needed. But there's a slight difference here in his tone with the Pharisees and Sadducees. We see it in verse 4. At the end of this narrative, he says, so he left them and departed. He said the same thing again, as he'd said a couple, of week, uh, a couple of chapters ago. But at this point, that was their last chance. We see the narrative changing after this in terms of how Jesus responds to them. There was an open invitation for the last, for the first part of his ministry to them saying, this is what is happening. Read the signs of the times. He said to them, this is about the Messiah. This is about what you've, you see in your scriptures. How can you not understand those things? He says to them, even at this stage in history, they knew how to predict the weather. They would use red sky at night. They would use red sky in the morning. They, they knew those things. It's almost one of those things for us. How much more <laughs> for us? We can read the weather probably a little bit better. We have satellite. We have all these things. We're, very, we're getting very good at that. And yet, many people can't read the signs of the times to do with who Jesus is, where we sit in history. For us now, we're sitting between Jesus coming the first time and Jesus' return. 
obviously for them at this point, this was the first coming of the Messiah. But he's saying to them, you, you, can, you can see around you. You see these things in the weather. You can predict what's going to happen. How can you not see what's happening? Let's keep our eyes open to see what God is doing and we can respond to him. So as much as Jesus is saying the same thing to them, he's also saying, well, this is actually the last time I'm going to say it. He then moves on and we see actually the turning of the Pharisees and the Sadducees to then look to get him crucified. And that's where the, the, uh, the narrative then goes after this. So we've got those two accounts. Let's move then into this next part, which actually helps us to bring a little bit of clarity to what the feeding of the 5,000 was about, the feeding of the 4,000. Jesus is then dealing with his disciples, these guys that have been going around following him and are seeing all that has happened. They've seen Jesus feed 5,000. And remember, it's not just about the feeding. It was the part of the, the meeting before that, when he was healing, when he was uh, sending them away well, he was teaching them about the kingdom of God. We see the same thing here. This isn't just about the provision of bread for them. He had healed them. They'd seen the glory and the majesty and the power of God in these signs, and they had been praising the God of Israel. And just to then help them out, Jesus didn't want them fainting on the way back to the cities. He said, okay, we're going to provide for them. The disciples, this is the second time they've been in this situation, still are looking at it in an earthly way. <laughs> They're thinking, how can we? we? Again, we could maybe try and go and get enough bread, but we thought about that last time and that didn't really work. What, what do we do? Jesus, you know, in their minds, they may be thinking, this is a different crowd. Yes, you provided for the Jewish nation. We kind of get that. But these guys, are you really going to do the same for, for these people? And Jesus says, yes. Again, they bring loaves. It's almost as though as the disciples then say, oh, we've also got some fish. You did that last time as well. We don't just want the bread. You did it with the fish as well last time. But Jesus wonderfully provides for them. But then we have this time where Jesus is with the disciples, almost as he's promised to them. Over, we've been waiting for a number of weeks for them to have time with Jesus. <laughs> Jesus kept saying, we're going to come away with me. We'll have a little bit of a, of a break. We'll be able to explain things. We've had all these things happen. We now find that Jesus being able to speak with his disciples. When they got to the other side, the disciples had forgotten the bread. You'd have thought they'd have had enough with them they just collected all these leftover pieces they didn't even have to buy it and yet they'd forgotten to bring any bread and Jesus said to them in that context watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees Jesus is teaching them something very profound here and actually something I want us to hear, and we're going to look at that in a, a second about what that could mean for us as well. But let's just see what happens in this context. Jesus gives them something very profound. Essentially, again, another parable. He's talking uh, in, in images, in language, which then portrays something bigger and a bigger concept he wants them to get. Their first reaction is to think that this is talking about their physical needs. What they have in front of them, they, they are in a situation where they have no bread. Hey, how, guys, how are we going to eat tonight? Who knows whether there was one of the disciples that was meant to bring the bread, and they're blaming them at this point. You've forgotten the bread again. And they think that what Jesus is saying is applying to that immediate need. Jesus is saying, no, it's not about that. And I just wonder if there's times, and I know I've done this before, when Either on a Sunday, you're hearing teaching, or you even outside of that context, you hear a word from God during the week when you're reading your Bible. Someone else comes and shares a word with you from God, and immediately we apply it just to our immediate physical needs and think, great, that's what God is talking about here. Are we missing something of what God is wanting to say to us about his kingdom, about his character, who he is? Because actually what Jesus then says he knows their physical needs are going to be met. He says to them, do you not remember what I did with the 5,000 and the 4,000? Hey, there's only 12 of you here. I think we can probably, I can cover this one as well. He's saying to them, that will be met. Do you not yet perceive? 
how is it that you fail to understand how uh, that I do not speak about the physical bread here because he's wanting to speak to them about something bigger than just that. God knows what we need in our physical provision. He has enough. He's shown himself to be faithful. He's shown himself to be powerful enough to provide, to give us all that we need. So he will. But there are times when God speaks where it's about more than just our physical needs. It's about his kingdom. It's about going forward, what's going to be important. And this is what he's saying to the disciples, because he knows there's not long before he's going to be crucified. He'll come back to life, but also he will leave them. And they will then go out and start spreading the gospel amongst the nation of Israel, amongst the Gentiles, in the power of the Spirit. Jesus knows that that's what's coming, so he's teaching them something very important, and he says to them, watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, Mark's account of this one also adds in about Herod as well, so the leaven of Herod, and I'll show you how those two things may be linked together with this one. Matthew, again, is speaking to a Jewish audience, therefore he's going to speak specifically about these different sects within the, um, the Jewish uh, religious order and speak to them about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but uh, Mark also adds in about uh, Herod as well. So what is it that Jesus is getting at here? What is, what is he saying? Why do they need to be aware of the leaven? Now, we remember we've had lots of parables that have linked with leaven. So we know, hopefully, a little bit about what that is now. This small bit of dough that then you save with the yeast and then you put it into a new batch in order to, for it to then uh, become, uh, to rise. We've looked at it in the context of it being the kingdom, the kingdom is like that, that it goes out. But that's the only time when leaven is said as a positive thing. Every other time in the Bible, leaven is actually referred to kind of as, as an evil thing of how sin can work its way in and actually cause damage. It's one of the reasons why in the Old Testament, when the people of Israel left Egypt and they went with no leaven, it was that sense of leave everything behind. Don't take anything of of Egypt with you we don't want the, the the new this new bread to be infiltrated by things that are not of God so we see this here that Jesus is saying to the disciples as the kingdom now goes out be aware other translations say be on your guard for the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees well what are we talking about here uh, do we have Pharisees and Sadducees around at the moment? Do we, are we looking out for these people? Well, no. But we can see what is being said here by who they were. Now, the Pharisees were people, teachers of the law. They were very, very keen to keep the law protected. They would put rules in place in order to protect the rules. They were what we would class possibly as legalistic. They were leaders of the synagogue. They had this emphasis on your personal piety, your personal holiness, what you do, this external nature of how I look in front of other people. Jesus has already addressed that with them, saying this isn't about your external, what you show in front of other people. It's about what's going on in your heart. So Jesus is saying to the disciples, as the kingdom goes, Beware of this leaven, this sin that can creep in, that promotes outward appearance, that, are, that, that says you have to look a certain way, you have to pretend to behave a certain way. Luke's gospel really helps us in this one. In the same narrative that he's saying in chapter 12, And verse 1, Jesus says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, and he gives us clarity as to what it is, which is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is what Jesus was warning the disciples about at this stage. How much do we need to hear that now as well? Within the church, within those that say they're following Jesus. It's not as though hypocrisy ended at this point when the Pharisees were no longer around. Beware of hypocrisy. How do we guard against it? Well, I think referring and 
meditating upon what Jesus then says next in Luke's account. You can read it through if you want to, or page 1035 in Luke 12 and verse 2. So he's saying, beware of the level of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Then he says, nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light. And what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. You see what Jesus is saying to them there? He's, that's in the context of this hypocrisy of the Pharisees. They would say certain things in public, and yet in their own homes with other people, they would say something different. Jesus is saying those things that you say in secret to other people will be proclaimed from the rooftops. Now, if we take Jesus seriously there, that really, for me, changes how I speak to other people, how I even speak to myself. If I'm saying things differently on a Sunday morning to what I'm saying to other people or to myself, actually what I'm saying back here is going to be amplified because that's what's in my heart, not what is said in front of everybody. And that's a real challenge. Jesus is saying this will happen. So in order to guard against the leaven of the Pharisees, keeping that in mind is a big incentive because the things of your heart or the things that you've said to other people that are putting down the kingdom of God, that maybe say, I don't really believe those things. I go on a Sunday or I say I know these things, but it doesn't really affect me. Those things will be proclaimed from the rooftops. So we need to be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Now also, we can see into the book of Acts and into some of the apostles' teaching as well, we can see what they did about this. I love it that we, we now have that extra part of the, of, the, of the accounts that then go on. What did the disciples do about this? Well, actually, they didn't go around teaching about the feeding of the 5,000 or the feeding of the 4,000. That was an amazing miracle. I'm sure they would have told people at times, but the teaching that they gave to the new churches to new people hearing about Jesus was about Jesus' death and resurrection. Paul's teaching particularly addresses a lot of this. I'd encourage you, if you, can, if you have time over the summer, which hopefully you will do, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, these letters and Corinthians that were written to different churches, read them through in this context. Read them through that actually... The, the, the apostles, and Paul was one that was then brought in to also um, speak about this, they are guarding against this leaven that could seep into the church. They are dealing with these issues. Hypocrisy needs to be gone. It's interesting because, as Paul says in much of his writings, he was a Pharisee. He tells everyone that. I used to be. I was the top of the class, he would say. I was ahead of everybody else, and yet that means nothing. That means nothing is what Paul was saying. He continually came back to my identity, and what I'm going to preach is in what Jesus has done, his death and his resurrection. So let's be those that put that into practice. I'll maybe this week send out just some of the texts here that you can read. Galatians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3 as well, that give you some of these examples that Paul was speaking about. But we also have this thing of Jesus warning him against the yeast or the leaven of the Sadducees. So you've got the Pharisees, which is this uh, hypocrisy, putting up an external view, but also we have him warning against the Sadducees, and as I said, Mark's account also, instead of Sadducees, says of Herod. Now, the Sadducees were another part of uh, the religious order within Judaism. They would be the ones that would be normally uh, the, the, the chief priests were part of the Sadducees. They were actually people that were more concerned with political gain than necessarily the word and the law of God. So you can see what Jesus is saying here, can't you? Beware of this 
sin that could creep into your lives, into the lives of the church, into the kingdom, that is hypocrisy. But also be aware of cozying up too close to what's going on around you. You see, as you go through the gospel accounts, the Sadducees were the ones that were, they were in with Rome. They were the ones that would maybe concede certain things. Let's just keep Rome, you know, our occupiers happy. Let's maybe not do what everything that the law says, because that might get us into trouble. They were very accommodating of the Roman law and the Roman rule. And also, if we're looking at the thing of Herod as well, well, that was the, the reigning monarch at the time. Someone who we know was all about personal gain, <laughs> was all about doing whatever he wanted to do. He's already had John the Baptist killed because he was saying, don't do something that he wanted to do. He was about lying. He was about adultery. All these things, Jesus is saying, be aware, be on your guard against this. Be on your guard against this. Now, what could that look like for us? We need to be aware of hypocrisy, but also we need to be aware of secularism, compromise on modern day ethical issues, political ideologies, seeking the wisdom of man, being kind of having our minds just drenched in all of that and starting to listen to that more than we do the word of God. Again, the apostles, as they went around the churches, they kept bringing people back to what Jesus has done. When sin started to come into the church, Paul, when he was speaking to the church in Corinth, encourages them to come back to what God says. Not start to accommodate maybe what the culture around them is saying. Well, actually, that's okay. Relationships within the church, relationships uh, within marriages. Oh, the, the culture is saying this, therefore we'll, we'll accommodate that. No, he's saying stick with what the Bible says about that. Let's be on our guard. And being on our guard means that when sin is known about, when it comes to light, we need to deal with it. Graciously, God will deal with many things in our lives. You know, he'll remind us, we can repent, we come, we bring it to God. But there are other things that do come to light amongst your brothers and sisters. It does say, come and bring, say to one another how you're struggling. We need to deal with that. We need to be those that are open and honest with one another when we gather together, when we're in life groups, when you're with your Christian brothers and sisters. If you're struggling with things, bring it into the light so that it can be dealt with because things that aren't dealt with will be like this leaven that will start to seep in that will start to then just become a, we're used to it. We then become very much the same as the culture around us. We're no longer different. So let's guard against everything that he, that, that is around us. Let's just finish by turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So I was saying this was Paul dealing with uh, this exact situation. <laughs> I'm sure Paul would have heard from the other uh, disciples about what Jesus said about guarding against the, the leaven of the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees, and therefore he's dealing with it in the very practical nature of what's happening in the church in Corinth. Verse 6, it says, your boasting is not good. They were boasting about the fact that that this is, we're actually fine with this relationship that's happening within the church, because actually our culture is saying it's fine. Your boasting is not good, he says. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. And this is where I want us to land today. We're going to break bread together in a minute. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but within the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Those of you that know the story of the Exodus, that passage is hugely insightful in terms of what Jesus is saying. The, the picture that the Exodus tells us of what is then going to be happening to us now, the old leaven of malice and evil is gone away with, but the new unleavened bread 
of sincerity and truth. And the way in which we guard against that is by continually coming to Christ, for Christ, our Passover lamb, the unblemished lamb, has been sacrificed. That's where we can then have this understanding of what it is to know sincerity, of know what truth is, because of who Jesus is. Romans 12 goes on to speak to us about the renewing of our minds. Don't conform to the way of this world. Don't be infiltrated by the things that you hear. And the way you do that is by reading the word of God, being filled with the spirit and staying in amongst the people of God. It's talking to one another because we'll start to spot it amongst one another. We can help one another in this. Let's be those that respond well to what Jesus is saying here. So he will provide for our physical needs. Don't worry about that. He fed the 5,000. He fed the 4,000. But we still need to continue to guard against the leaven of hypocrisy, but also compromise. And if we do that, we see this wonderful kingdom of God growing as it will do. And I look out and I see amongst the people here, God's got his hand on us. We can be those that spread the kingdom of God this summer as we listen to what he's saying. But we're going to come and we'll, um, we'll break bread together to help us, bring us back to this uh, physical representation of what Jesus has done for us to celebrate, to remember, to look ahead to his return, to understand the sign of the times, to understand that the Messiah has come and that the Messiah will return again. We are in this middle phase we look to his return, but we look to what he has done, and we live as those that, are, that have been bought at a price to be part of this kingdom, this unleavened kingdom, free from all of these things, free from malice and evil, that have sincerity and truth at the heart of all that we do. So let's do that. Um, we won't have time for a song. I think that's right. We'll just come and we'll share it together, and we'll pray for one another. Let me pray for us, then we'll break bread together. Father, we... Thank you for what we have read in your words here. Lord, we thank you that we see this outworked through church history. Lord, we thank you that your disciples took what you said here seriously and then spoke into this, guarding against hypocrisy, guarding against compromise. And we thank you that by your spirit, we can also do that. We thank you, you have empowered us. And as we come now to celebrate what you've done for us, we place our hope firmly in the Passover lamb, the unblemished sacrifice that was Jesus that gave himself for us, that through his body, through his blood of this new covenant means that we have, we stand righteous before you. We have cast off the old. We now live in the new. We no longer have to be constrained by this old way of living because of what Jesus has done. Father, we thank you for what you're doing and what you're going to do. Amen. Mm -hmm.